welcome. Um, this is, um, as has already been said, as Tammy uh, and uh, Priska have already said um, today, uh, this is rather a remarkable um, occasion, I think, for all of us. Um, and for me, just looking at the program that we have for this panel, we have six speakers in six different cities, as far as I can see, um, plus me in yet another city. So that's seven. So I think this is really um, Domitor going global. And I think, you know, while we all miss not being in Paris, um, uh, there are certain advantages. <laughs> and I must say, browsing the wonderful contributions that um, many of you have sent in, and especially for this panel, which I've been looking at most recently, uh, it's really, I think, fantastic. Um, and the fact that they will stay online, I hope for some time, is also important because, you know, if you're at a conference in Paris or anywhere and you miss a session, you've missed it. Yeah. So um, we're, we're definitely seeing advantages here. Um, okay, without further ado, this mm -hmm. second panel is called um, The Professionalization of Filmmaking. I'm, I'm going to do this entirely in English uh, for the sake of speed rather than try to translate everything. So let me uh, welcome the participants, or all six of them, and I'll just summarize very briefly who they are. We have uh, Oksana Cifranova from Yale, speaking from Yale University, I imagine, <laughs> um, who has been studying the work of Yevgeny Bauer um, and has come up with some extremely interesting um, information about the theatrical um, work that shaped Bauer's career when he became a filmmaker. Very interesting presentation, um, beautiful illustrations, if I may say so. Clara Auclair, uh, formerly of Paris, currently at the University of Rochester, um, working at uh, George Eastman Museum, I believe, uh, who is also talking about set design, set designers uh, in early cinema, in particular, Ben Carré, uh, rather well-known, and Henri Minessier, not so well-known. And um, these are two important designers, of course, who had a training in Paris, uh, in France, and then crossed the Atlantic and become part of the um, emergent industry in America, which of course Pathé had a big part in, in launching in, in Fort Lee. Uh, Anna Kovalova, uh, from speaking to us, I think from St. Petersburg. Um, uh, Anna has been looking at um, the early Russian film press, and her title is Tears and Laughter, Filmmakers in Early Russian Cinema Press. And she's presented five really rather wonderful vignettes, satirical vignettes, as she points out, and they're very funny too, of um, different types of early filmmaker, different people, different roles within the filmmaking process. Artemis Willis, uh, speaking to us from Boston, True to her vocation as a lanternist, <laughs> um, a true crossover person. Um, uh, and I, and Artemis's um, title is Lantern Work Circa 1900. And she, she begins with a, a very striking case study, as it were, of how the same setup, the same setting, same actors, performers could both be part of a life model set, of lantern slides, and of a film. And I think this really deepens our, our understanding of the extent to which magic lantern work and film work ran absolutely in parallel for a very long period indeed. It was not certainly not a case of one stopping and the other taking over. They were deeply um, connected. And finally, Alison, who I hope is now with us as a participant, uh, Alison Griffiths uh, from New York, formerly from this side of the Atlantic, but now long, long established on the other side. Um, her title is Fieldwork as Filmwork, Professionalism, Exploration and Cinema. And her theme is how the coming of film 
um, transformed traditional roles, that of the explorer, for instance, through the film as a means of portraying the work of exploration. So that's the, uh, the panel. And I took the liberty of asking everyone on the panel if they would. Yeah, I think you missed uh, Guillaume. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, Guillaume, I can't read my own writing. I'm so sorry, thank you. <laughs> Guillaume. Problem. Uh, we were corresponding earlier this afternoon by, by email. Um, Guillaume's subject is the place of the, the scenario writer, the scenarist, uh, the independent scenarist in the freelance American market. And again, he's dealing with a, uh, a moment of transition the transition from being able to submit a script in outline form to the requirement that the script had to be delivered in shot breakdown form, um, a continuity script. And again, this, this is like several of the contributions to um, this panel and to the conference as a whole. This really deals with that moment of professionalization in one particular department, the script. Department of Script Writing. Apologies, Guillaume, for leaving you out. It's a big panel. You're forgiven, <laughs> no problem. Um, so I asked everybody on the panel, because I think it's important that we hear everybody's voice um, and we have only have a short time for discussion. You never know how discussions will go. Um, I just asked everybody if they might just reflect very briefly indeed on what the theme of this particular conference how it affected what they chose to present. Our theme being the craft, the techniques, the often invisible uh, workers who contributed to the creation of cinema. And I just wonder if it's, let's see if it's, this is going to work. <laughs> I'm going to take um, the panel in the order in which they appear on our agenda. So I'm going to just go to Oksana first of all, and ask if Oksana can give us just a word about how the theme affected your presentation. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Because I have very yes. bad microphone. Oh, I can. Okay, you, everyone. And greetings, greetings from Connecticut, not the happiest place to be right now, but yeah. Uh, and I want to briefly thank organizers for tremendous efforts to move everything online. I know how difficult it was and how we all have been not so immediately cooperative and how much labor it was. So thank you. Uh, what I presented is a tiny, tiny fragment of my book that called From Garden to Kino, Evgeny Bauer an Expanded Environment of Early Cinema, and that deals with um, generally with relationship between uh, cinema culture, early cinema culture with designed environment. And consider environment as a medium through which probably we can theorize early uh, film history. And Bauer, absolutely perfect figure for that, uh, to explore intertwined histories, milieu design and image making between basically for about three and a half decades in late Imperial Russia. And he worked in many, many different media and arts and practices and created gardens, created theater scenography, been photographer, cameraman, film set designer before film became film director, stage tableau vivant, many, many different activities. So the theme crafts, techniques, technologies, uh, definitely, first of all, it shaped how I think about an early practitioner, about the career of early practitioners, public, interesting publications. Uh, Jan uh, has uh, one of them and we have several uh, approaches how to talk about early film practitioners. And so one of my book's narrative is an emergence of film director as a profession, as idea that we can attach now to. And Bauer transitioned from skills, particular type of skills of stage designer to the craft of film set designer and then director. And he was not a pioneer, film pioneer. He joined cinema very, uh, cinema was already in France in 1913. It was his very much conscious choice. And his corpus of film generally 
can be talked and represent to us the earliest case of art cinema and probably allow us to talk to decenter art cinema traditional temporal geographical framework to relocate them to late imperial Russia. And the theme of crafts, techniques, and technologies actually encouraged me to rethink or go beyond this art and actor paradigm that still dominated how not only silence studies of silence cinema but dominate a lot of our discourses and um, i wanted to highlight the, imp the important role of the designed environment uh, that have played in shaping uh, cinematic culture and film text and to think about cinema as a device as a technology itself as kind of machine as a technical device and perfect, probably like cinema as an atmospheric machine in this specific case and that's um, oksana i'm going to yeah. cut in and say that yeah. terrific i think you got us to just the point that i wanted us to do okay so no, don't anymore at the moment i think there will be questions yeah sure <laughs> Um, I want to make sure that everyone has a very brief moment just to focus on, uh, and, and I think you've explained that very well, but don't, don't feel you need to summarize uh, your whole presentation because happily we have them online and um, there they all are, so <laughs> don't worry, the, the detail is all to be consumed at everyone's leisure. So Clara, uh, could I turn to you, Clara, and yeah. ask if you could just say just a few words about how the theme of the conference affected your decision to talk about these two designers, about Menissier and Carré. Sure, yeah, uh, thank you, Jan. Can you, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, thank you, Jan. Thank you. Merci beaucoup à tous les organisateurs pour uh, Je suis très ici. Um, uh, je vais parler en anglais Lentement, et <laughs> maybe so can follow. Uh, so this um, theme worked very well for me because I worked, I'm trying to um, work and reconstitute the network of professional um, that came from France to settle in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And I chose Ben Carré and Henri Menessier because I'm working mostly from testimonies. Um, I chose to, to uh, this source as my main source and um, it was very interesting to me when I uh, and uh, striking to see how those professional talked about their professions and how the hierarchy between um, filmmaker cameraman set designer and all the other ones uh, lab worker for example are uh, almost never mentioned in testimonies even the lab workers themselves I'm working on a different person Francis Dublier who uh, worked in laboratory and, and uh, in his memoirs talk very little, uh, oh no, in his papers, he, doesn't, he hasn't written any memoirs, in his papers talks very little about his own work. So this was really uh, enlightening for me to, to look at this perspective, to see um, how this hierarchy is formed in the discourse and in the memorialization itself. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Parfait, merci. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so let me come to Anna, Anna Kabalova. In um, if I can ask you, Anna, to um, I can't see you at the moment, but I'm sure you're there. Uh, um, to just I'm say here. ah, hello. <laughs> now you are. <laughs> to say very briefly um, how the theme of the conference shaped your presentation. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my first dormitory in my life. I've been dreaming about it for many years. And of course, I thought that it was very responsible. And uh, at first, the theme seemed to be difficult because we, are go we were going to speak about invisible uh, in film history. But um, and I was thinking, what is the most invisible? I, mean, I was looking for something the most invisible ever. And I don't know um, about um, European and uh, American film history, but for Russian film history, I think the most invisible thing is uh, film trade press because we don't know much about people who were working on it. And that's why I, I have chosen this topic. So I'm grateful for putting the conference online and 
for this challenging and stimulating topic for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. That, that's, that's terrific. Um, Guillaume, could you say a word um, about how the theme of the conference focused your presentation? Yes, I'll do this bit in French, okay? So I might switch to... Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Donc le thème des métiers euh, était bien choisi pour moi parce que je, je prépare en fait présentement une thèse sur la scénarisation. Et évidemment, qui dit scénarisation dit scénariste, qui est quand même un métier assez important lorsqu'on parle de la fabrication des films de fiction à partir des années 10. Euh, le colloque m'a permis de pouvoir prendre un pas de côté sur l'élaboration de, de ma thèse et d'attaquer une question plus spécifique qui m'avait beaucoup interpellé et qui, je croyais, euh, s'accordait bien au thème du colloque, c'est-à-dire à partir de cet axe où on nous demande euh, d'éclairer des métiers ou des contributions qui sont moins reconnues. Oui, il y a des, il y a des scénaristes extrêmement reconnus au temps euh, des années 10 euh, dans le cinéma américain, mais il y a aussi tout un bassin de scénaristes indépendants qui ont été défavorisés dans l'histoire du cinéma, en fait, parce qu'on a très peu de, de documents sur leurs contributions, hormis euh, dans les trade papers euh, ici et là. Et ça m'a aussi permis d'aborder une question qui m'a toujours semblé sous-étudiée dans la recherche sur la scénarisation. C'est cette transition où on demandait des continuity scripts aux scénaristes indépendants. Et là, tout à coup, en 1916, on leur demande plutôt des synopsis détaillés, euh, qui est une transition qui, 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 qui ne va pas de soi du tout. Et bien qu'il y ait des articles et il y ait des livres qui discutent du freelance market américain et très bien, euh, la question précise du detail synopsis est toujours escamotée. Il y a deux attitudes que j'ai remarquées surtout, c'est un, on va euh, porter une conclusion hâtive, on va dire, et voilà, on demande aux scénaristes indépendants des synopsis détaillés et cela est le signe du déclin du freelance market et, et on, on ne s'occupe plus de la question quand en fait, euh, le, le marché euh, des, des scénarios indépendants va être encore ouvert jusqu'au milieu des années 20. Donc, ce n'est pas aussi simple que ça. Et aussi cette idée que vu que le texte est en prose, ça devient moins de la scénarisation pure et dure et on se désintéresse de cette question-là pour plutôt continuer avec le développement du continuity script. Et j'avais l'intuition qu'il y avait quelque chose d'intéressant à rechercher là et le colloque, le thème du colloque m'a donné cette opportunité d'essayer de, de, de confirmer mes, mes intuitions. J'ai été très heureux de voir que dans le Moving to Picture World, seulement là, Euh, ça avait créé toute une polémique, en fait, et qu'il y avait un discours très intéressant sur la question et que les avis étaient très mitigés. Donc, ça va nous permettre de faire, je crois, un article intéressant là-dessus, parce que dans les manuels en tant que tels, on voit la transition, mais c'est vu que c'est des documents plus officiels, on ne voit pas la réaction des scénaristes indépendants. Et ainsi, euh, le colloque devient une belle opportunité pour essayer euh, d'éclairer ce pan du freelance market qui est un peu obscurci jusqu'à maintenant, et de combler, autrement dit, ce manque dans la recherche sur la, la scénarisation au temps du euh, muet. Merci. Parfait. <rire> Je suis très heureux que le, le colloque a, a précipité. Oui, non, c'est ça. Oui, oui. Pour, pour, pour des autres aussi, j'espère. Uh, Artemis. Hi. Um, hi. <laughs> hi. Well, I thought I'd, I, I actually kind of really ruminated about the question of what the conference theme, how it encouraged me to think about the field afresh. And I have a kind of an answer in five easy pieces. Um, so well, first of all, uh, the first thing that popped into my head was this title, subtitle from Michelle Duny, St. Denise's book, The Rediscovery of Style. Um, you know, he makes this case that Stanislavski is too one-sided and narrow and, you know, that just kind of popped into my head. But the theme um, is near and dear to me because I was a craftsperson throughout my 20s and I was an art, uh, art department uh, person in stage and film productions and I was even a union card holder briefly in IATSE. Um, so, and actually the theater unions came to be at the time, you know, of circa 1900 um, in the UK as well as here. Uh, so, um, you know, this theme has encouraged me to understand style as being a carrier of the traces of production um, and, you know, to kind of analyze uh, artifacts as blueprints for the screen events and experiences that they were designed, you know, the images and the transitions making a sequence together um, and to locate media interaction in stylistic change. Um, because how the forms handled the gag, itself a unique narrative, non-narrative, quasi-narrative form, um, you know, are really different in 1898 and 1899. 
And that's a kind of an extraordinary thing to kind of hone and zoom down. Um, you know, and so it's also kind of encouraged me to understand style as a place where historical, cultural, and formalist technological um, can meet, uh, which I think is important. And, um, you know, and to apply the methods and approaches of the new film history as media archaeology, um, the rigorous kind of early cinema approaches to the lantern. Uh, as opposed to just looking at the lantern as some ancillary, you know, thing. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Alison, um, I, again, I'm not seeing you, Alison, but are you with us uh, visibly? I am. I see myself as Demetrius. <laughs> 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 yes. do, you, do you see me? I do see you and I hear you. Okay, well. I don't know why I've assumed I, his identity. I think we should uh, take this up privately in the chat at some point. But anyway, I'm here in whatever fashion. I hope people Excellent. can recognize me. I'll be extremely brief because I can see we have some fantastic questions in the chat yeah, already and do. time is running out. Um, I wanted to kind of think about the theme of this conference in a slightly more sort of metaphorical way and explore how cinema um, contributed to the professionalization of um, a associated fields around exploration. Um, I really wanted to think about ideas of geography surveying exploration in the popular imaginary. And I actually want to thank the Domitor community for giving me some wonderful suggestions for films representing geographers and surveyors. And if you help me with that uh, endeavor, you'll see that I indeed refer to many of these films in my paper. So I'm thinking about a kind of a counter-professionalism as well, though, through looking at exhibition at the Explorers Club. So, you know, how did cinema kind of support the fields of exploration, but also how did exploration itself create alternative um, modalities for cinema? So I'll stop right there, but delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Wonderful. Uh, we do indeed have a lot of questions and comments coming in, um, as, as you rightly say, and um, I'm looking for where we should start. Well, let's just Let's go back a little bit to uh, Jean-Pierre had a question to um, uh, Oksana uh, about Bauer. Um, and this is a kind of wide ranging question, but it's an interesting one. Uh, isn't Bauer's definition of the art of the filmmaker as a totality, just what the next generation of Soviet filmmakers wanted to deconstruct um, with the overfragmentation of editing? Mm. Uh, yes, I, but for some reason I cannot see the chat, but I, I think I understand the question. Oh, right. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, yes, for a certain degree, yes. But if we think about that for Bauer, it, we don't know how Bauer felt himself about that. We know responses of critics to kind of assigning him to be a good film director because he can create totality that they thought it is totality of atmosphere. If we think about that film director is the good, is the one who can manage technique and technology for creating atmosphere. Yes, it can be totality, but it also can be something created via montage. It will be different type of atmosphere. Yes, in terms of cinematic text, of course, of course, that cinema should be deconstructed, chopped out, uh, and yeah. Yeah. Even, yeah, even despite this connection that could show being yeah. yeah, the pupil of Bauer and building sets with him. So, yeah. yeah. But the, yeah, in terms of atmosphere, it can be either way. Uh huh. Okay, that's that's really. I'm not not going to pursue that. But that's an area of great interest to me. But we must try to represent the, the wonderful breadth of this panel. Thank you very much, uh, Oksana. There's a question from Frank Kessler um, to Artemis. Uh, which I'm seeing, and he's uh, Frank is saying, is this kind of parallel production between lat for lantern uh, set and film unique to Britain? Is there something similar in the field of nonfiction? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's it's actually <laughs> it's actually unique to uh, to to West Yorkshire and to the Bamforths, um, this specific yeah. case, and even yeah. to 1899. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the kinds of 
interaction um, and reciprocal interchange between the lantern and early film um, during this circa 1900 period, I think that there are other instances of uh, when we see the old acting new, the new acting old, both acting ambivalent. Um, yeah, no, I think there are plenty of different uh, instances of that, which I kind of tease out in my Lanternology book. Right, it's a Bamforth story. <laughs> this one is, yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, but Bamforth. also, imp also importantly, it's not a you know a James Bamforth story. It's a Janie and Lizzie and Frank and Clements and you know the uh, you know it's not just one kind of um, you know guy who was in the studio who founded the whole thing. But I think it was a collective enterprise. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Now there's a question here from Mahmoud. Uh, Vahidpur. Um, it's, it's a Russian question, <laughs> um, and it may, it may be that, that both uh, Anna and uh, uh, Oksana have got something to say about this, but do be brief. The question is about the place of the Thousand and One Nights story, the Scheherazade story, in Russian cinema. And um, uh, Mahmoud's question, he's, he's working on the design of Leo Baxt, and he wants to know if there's something on this subject in the cinema, an early Russian cinema, about the uh, the Scheherazade story. That's how I'm summarizing the question. Uh, Anna, do, does that be, mean uh, anything to you? Well, um, if we take the uh, Russian cinema before the revolution, like yeah. uh, before 1917, I don't think that we have 1001 nights but we have a lot of uh, fascinating uh, plots about East. And so a colleague of mine has done some research on this Eastern plots. She yep. took a, a large corpus of plots. So maybe if you are interested, I could con give, you, give you her contact. Right. And as for Brax, um, there is an interesting essay written by Bax about early film. Uh, it was written about 1917, so 1916, I think. So if you, well, are interested, I can uh, email it or something. Right. So right. just to be brief. This one question for Anna that I think we missed was, uh, uh, Stephen Bottomer was asking, uh, can you indicate roughly how many stories you selected these five from? Right, right, yes. Well, yeah, thank you, Stephen, for this question. Um, uh, I have read about uh, 300 uh, stories and I'm still collecting all of those. Uh, thanks for Domitor, to Domitor because that's why I have chosen um, this branch of research. But there are more actually because uh, almost every issue of, uh, of a trade press journal has one or two stories like that. So I've just chosen five, which I liked for the presentation for the paper, but uh, of course, there are so much more. Uh, thank you. Uh, Oksana, um, does that, does the Scheherazade 1001 Night story mean anything to you? For well, early cinema, I also don't know. I know the earliest example from the 40s in of cinema. Yeah, so, but of course it was staged. Yeah. In, in Imperial Theatre, but but not the stories. But in cinema, I don't know. Okay, that's that's great. Just checking. <laughs> We've got two experts here, so we have a, a question from Scott, um, Scott Curtis, um, to Alison. And Scott's question, I'll just read it, is about the mechanism of knowledge transmission amongst the members of the Explorers Club. Were they self-taught amateurs? taking on all aspects of film craft, or did some of them take advantage of professional filmmaking, craftsmen, editors, title makers, etc.? I don't know if you can see that question, Alison. Yes, I see the question, thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Scott. Um, I would say that there was a mixture. Um, there are large scale expeditions such as the Fonthrop expedition from the Amon H that took um, Henry Cowling, a professional cinematographer with them. Obviously the 1924 second attempt on Everest takes Captain John Knoll along as a professional um, cinematographer. So there are large big budgeted expeditions that are clearly drawing upon um, the expertise. 
of professionals and these films are going through sort of typical channels of being edited, et, et cetera. But there's also some indication that um, these explorers were simply, you know, sending out their films to be edited. And there's very little detail about where these films were going. I mean, occasionally you'll hear reference to often a, a, a woman who had been selected to edit a film. Um, the Explorer itself, its it, club itself had um, a dark room. So there was a great deal of um, developing of photographs going on there. And um, for a small annual fee, the members could get access to the equipment and the chemicals, etc. cetera. Um, by the twenties and thirties, obviously they're relying upon um, the sort of, you know, trades and discourses around um, amateurism. And so there are various guidebooks and handbooks that would have helped them. But unfortunately there, there isn't much, you know, really sort of granular detail about um, what happens when they return from the field in terms of, I think they thought that that was maybe something that was shared anecdotally in the lectures, but it wasn't something that they were putting out in pamphlets or sort of making publicly available. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to rush on to another question from Demetrius to, um, oh yeah, wait a minute, no, see, that's, a, that's another one actually to Alison, hang on, my, my chat panel. Um, Demetrius says, I've been fascinated by the question of gender, the multiple couple explorers. <laughs> Was there a pre-cinema archetype hmm. uh, that got this going or, and did it wane after the 1930s? Hmm. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of a pre-cinema couple. Um, you know, many uh, explorers did not want to take their wives. Uh, I mean, the sort of humor around the annual dinners, which uh, kept women out, suggests that these were often welcome breaks for both husband and wife to be apart. Um, obviously, Delia and um, Akeley, um, Martin and Osa Johnson, I mean, these are um, definitely a type in the 1930s. I mean, I think in 1920s and 30s. And I think when um, international travel became safer and more widely available, I think wives often wanted to go along. Um, but no, I, I don't really see this in the discourse of exploration at all. Um, you know, there were plenty of women who wanted to go along and, of course, wrote <laughs> letters to institutions, not just the Explorers Club. I mean, there were countless women who wrote letters to explorers at the AMNH wanting to be taken along on oh. expeditions. But, um, yeah, I mean, possibly if I were to look at newspaper cartoons or look at the sort of, um, you know, kind of parallel text around um, or at least comedic text, there might be some reference to perhaps how ridiculous the idea was of women going into, into the field. But yeah, that's an interesting, interesting question. Thank you. Uh, there's another question for, from Demetrius to Clara, um, which is, uh, sorry, I, I missed that a little bit earlier. The question to Clara is, um, have you looked at the, um, the population, uh, the uh, census records, I guess it would be of Fort Lee as a way of finding interesting information about the employees of the studios mm. in Fort Lee. Uh, oui, uh, je vais répondre en français pour qu'il y ait un peu de oui, bien sûr. <laughs> uh, mais oui, oui, uh, j'ai regardé. Bon, j'ai pas tout dépouillé encore, uh, mais j'ai regardé surtout justement autour de la famille de Francis Doublier parce que c'était un point d'entrée. J'avais un nom et effectivement, il uh, y a. Uh, alors, les données, il y a toujours la profession qui est, qui est indiquée euh, et euh, parfois euh, le laboratoire. Euh, et effectivement, euh, mais donc c'est parfois assez flou, ça dépend vraiment euh, de la personne qui recense. Donc, euh, euh, c'est difficile, mais euh, effectivement, c'est une, une des sources que je privilégie pour euh, lire un petit peu euh, euh, cette image euh, des studios et des employés. Euh, oui, et effectivement, je vois ta, ton euh, Dimitrios, euh, et ce n'est pas systématique, effectivement, donc c'est pour ça que c'est plus facile de, de suivre quand on a déjà une personne, mais pour euh, trouver des inconnus, euh, c'est plus compliqué, parce qu'il bah, y aura, euh, par exemple, je sais, Francis Doublier référencé comme acteur, alors que ce n'est pas du tout un acteur. Euh, effectivement, euh, c'est... 
c'est une source peu fiable, mais qui peut donner quand même une image du nombre de personnes qui travaillaient dans ces studios, euh, ou alors, et au, au, de la provenance aussi. Et euh, souvent, en... mais il y a des lieux de naissance. Oui, effectivement, il y a à chaque fois les lieux de naissance, donc c'est comme ça que je repère effectivement euh, s'il y a beaucoup de Français ou pas. Oui. Oui. Et uh, you use. C'est un peu la seule source que j'ai pour la plupart. There's a, a wonderful phrase in your presentation about a, the phantom network, the Brazil phantom of uh, people working in Fort Lee, which I think is, is it's a very interesting phrase because, of course, that idea of a, a phantom network would apply not just to Fort Lee, but to the communities that formed around all the studios, all the early studios everywhere. And we know that we will never know most of the names. I suppose my question, the question taking shape in my mind is, how would it change things if we did know all those names? That's a good question. <laughs> I, I have thought about this in relation to London, of course, as well. You know, um, I like you, I've found little bits of evidence, but um, they're only fragments. I don't know. Um, what interests me is people in Fort Lee. Uh, and so I th to me, it changes a lot to, to know the names or like to, to at least to have um, a better understanding, even on the of the number of people that was employed, of the shape yep. of the workforce. Absolutely. No, no. Uh, I think number is very and, important. Yeah, absolutely. That might and be gender true. too. Uh, um, is a good question for that. I mean, uh, c'était aussi une question pour Guillaume uh, uh, que j'avais pour Guillaume d'ailleurs sur uh, uh, les scénaristes, car on dit que beaucoup de ces scénaristes étaient indépendants, je ne sais pas, mais étaient des femmes. Et est-ce que c'est quelque chose qui retrouve dans dans la maison? Écoutez, le, le, les, les femmes sont omniprésentes dans la pratique de la scénarisation à cette époque-là. C'est pratiquement 50%, 50%, autant en ce qui a trait aux scénaristes professionnels, hein, et ceux qui sont très reconnus, la plupart des, des meilleurs scénaristes de l'époque sont des femmes. Et euh, si je me fie à, à la recherche que je peux faire dans les trade papers, où là je peux, euh, je peux voir un peu les noms des, des, des scénaristes indépendants qui, qui sont très rarement inclus dans les crédits, donc ce qui rend la, la recherche encore plus difficile, oui, les femmes sont omniprésentes, mais c'est comme je dis, c'est presque une, c est, c est une, une question difficile à, à répondre parce que pour eux, c'est absolument pas problématique à l'époque. Euh, les femmes peuvent, peuvent euh, devenir scénaristes, la porte est grande ouverte. Et je, je sais qu'en 1913, il y a une question spécifique dans un manuel qu'on pose à Epus Winthrop Sargent. Euh, il y a une femme qui lui a posé une question, elle lui a dit « Je suis une femme, je veux soumettre des, euh, des scénarios aux compagnies, est-ce que je devrais utiliser un pseudonyme masculin? » Et c'est très parlant que la réponse a été tout simplement absolument pas. Euh, les femmes sont très... Euh, certaines des meilleurs scénaristes sont des femmes et n'hésitez pas à envoyer les scénarios avec vos vrais noms, autrement dit. Um, now, I see there's also, while we have the camera on you, as it were, Guillaume, yes. uh, there is a question from uh, uh, Stéphanie. Um, oui. Oui. Euh, Avez-vous constaté des différences de pratiques entre les studios américains et les studios d'origine française établis aux États-Unis? Il faut être bref sur ça. <rire> C'est une très bonne question qui, qui est quand même difficile à répondre, mais de, de mémoire comme ça, je sais que Éclair, Pathé et également le studio de Gaston Méliès qui euh, a, a, a accepté des scénarios très tôt, euh, c'est drôle parce que leur attitude, c'est d'avoir des sujets hyper américains. On aurait pu penser qu'ils auraient pu se diversifier dans la, la façon qu'ils allaient traiter les films et les sujets. Et euh, une des choses qu'on qu remarque, c'est que les studios français aux États-Unis s'efforcent à faire des, des sujets qui sont extrêmement américains parce qu'ils ils, ils comprennent très bien, autrement dit, le marché au, auquel ils s'adressent. C'est ouais. intéressant, oui. Bon. Euh... Let's see. Now, I've not been looking at the Q&A. Has anybody else been looking at the Q&A? Do we have any anything coming up in that? No questions. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Okay, I'm going to look back through. I, I should also say, by the way, um, this is a good moment perhaps for anyone who's part of this panel, if you want to ask a, a question of someone else on the panel, <laughs> um, do feel free to do that. Question for Oksana. Um, I was wondering uh, how uh, did Bauer continue in his theater career um, in tandem with his uh, film work? And if so, if uh, you found any traces of theatrical uh, film influence on his theater practice? He continued yeah, until 1916. So basically till his last year in cinema. Mm -hmm. And he was continuous doing uh, like set design for a period of fairies or for short farces. Mm -hmm. And probably because we, it's so, such an ephemeral art, we have nothing left uh, from that <laughs> staging. And, but it's probably, uh, there are some cinematic influence, for example, like very interesting one of set design described, I think from 1915 or 1916, that he made um, a wall uh, of the house and put it like in a grid, multi-window grid, something mm -hmm. like we have now on Zoom right. and put different uh, into, he kind of made it like simultaneous montage mm -hmm. into one surface. So probably something considering his dense images that he tried always to put a lot of things into one frame, mm -hmm. that is, might be, yeah, but it's very, it's a very fascinating <laughs> topic. I'm trying to trace it, to trace it, but he can, he continued uh, simultaneously. He didn't drop it. Very cool. Thanks. That, that's really that's <laughs> extremely interesting, Oksana, because I think there is a tendency certainly when Bauer was discovered uh, back in the 80s, there was a, an assumption that he gave up theatre and threw himself into cinema. And of course, no one ever bothered to check that um, in, in those days. It, just, it was just a kind of assumption that obviously you would leave theatre and considering the um, scale of his filmmaking, it would be difficult to imagine him having a lot of time for theatre, but you're... No, he, he, he did, and surprisingly, he also did decorative design. He decorated for a year of film movie theater, several movie theaters. Oh, yes, 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 so yes. simultaneously with making films. That, that's... I think that underlines a theme which I see uh, running right across this conference and it's present within this panel, which is that really it's about the, the continuity uh, that runs across from in the largest f field, there is a continuity from the pre-cinema period, the literally pre-cinema period into the early cinema period. And there's a continuity of practices which continues across. And what we see is a whole series of modifications um, of those practices, but rarely is a practice completely abandoned. The practices continue, they're modified, but they don't stop which I think it has you know, quite important, profound consequences for, if you like, media theory and media history, which of course we've, this is one of the things that Domitor has been um, enlarging upon for many years, that um, cinema is not new in itself, but it is, it, it causes a huge modification of the ensemble of other practices and other professions and other media. Right, um, let me see, our time is running out uh, and I'm just quickly trying to read. Uh, oh, well, here, here's a, this is a, an organizational question from Elif um, asking, will, until when will the panel presentations remain available online? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone else know the answer, Tammy? Um, well, uh, according to Louis, who will know better than me, he said indefinitely that they will remain That's online semi-permanently. Yes. Um, I, I guess uh, on the site. So as long as uh, the Canadians are are willing to host us, they'll be there for a while. So that means that you can at your leisure go and, and look at specific presentations, which is great. Well, I think that's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, this is a real step forward. Um, it's perhaps slightly disconcerting to think we will all be haunted by what we said five years ago. But actually, mostly it's very good. And certainly the quality of all the presentations I've seen so far is fantastic. 
Um, I think people have really um, put a lot of effort into making them very, very interesting and very uh, elegant in many cases. I'm looking quickly to see uh, if I've missed any questions. Is anybody else looking to see if I've missed anything? Yes, Good everyone. It's fantastic. Louis has confirmed that the, the, that your contributions, all our contributions will remain for a very long time into the future. Okay. My, con <laughs> My apologies to Demetrius. <laughs> Uh, th th there's been some name confusion in the labeling of some, some, uh, some contributions, but I don't think that's too serious. Okay, yeah. yes, I'm going to draw these proceedings to a close. Um, May I ask a, a question to Anna before we, uh, sure. we stop that? Yes. Uh, Hannah, I, I guess that uh, those satirical papers were uh, mainly fictional, but do you think there's some chances that uh, they refer to some of the key players in the Russian film production at the time. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'm sure that, well, uh, many of them were not so fictional as they might seem. For example, there maybe you heard about it that there was a great story about stealing the war and peace plots. Uh, because when the World War I started, everyone wanted to present an adaptation of this novel. And so there is a very funny feeling about stealing Anna Karenina from one, of, and it was published like up after that. So we can see that uh, those people who were writing it, they just satirized uh, the film directors who were stealing war and peace, they just, well, but the problem is that in many cases, uh, we don't, we don't know, we cannot recognize those parallels. Sometimes we can, but sometimes we cannot. Thank you. I'll try to, well, point this out later. But uh, Anna, Anna, there is also the wonderful, one of the examples you give, uh, which is the theater owner, which I think is absolutely fantastic, where there is a real figure involved and that's Meyerholt. And um, if, if you haven't read Anna's uh, account, you should really read the story of, of Meyerholt as a, a real person who had appeared, who had made a film, going to the theatre and seeing his film cut to pieces and reorganised by the theatre owner. It's an amazing story. And it may, it, it may well point to a practice that happened elsewhere too. Yeah, undoubtedly. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, but, but, thank you. That, that's, that's, that's a real find, yeah. Yep. Wonderful. But I am going to wind up now. We should quit while we're ahead <laughs> because, because we're all strung out across different time zones. Um, and I guess, uh, well, it, it's later in Russia, I would say. Here it's um, early evening. Um, and hey, the day is just beginning over there on the other side of the Atlantic. Here it's noon. Exactly. <laughs> noon. Well, <laughs> It's a very strange experience to have a conference so so spread out in this way, but I think a wonderful experience. And um, I think for me, this afternoon, in our terms in Britain, <laughs> has been a confirmation that it really can work. And uh, it's, it's an enormous pleasure to see everyone uh, in, I was going to say in the flesh, but in the postage stamp on the screen. Um, many old friends and new friends as well. And um, I just want to thank you all for wonderful papers and for throwing yourselves into the discussion. It's been, I think, very rich and um, as good as we would have had uh, if we'd all been sitting around in a room. <laughs>